A major vulnerability affects modems, SIM swapping is still a huge threat, and SHA-1 still kinda sucks. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings! I am Shannon Morris, and this is ThreatWire for January 14, 2020. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. If you are interested in supporting ThreatWire on Patreon, hit up patreon.com slash ThreatWire. Thank you so much to my patrons, and now, on to the news. Four security researchers at Danish IT security consultancy company Liarbirds found a vulnerability in multiple brands and models of cable modems that use broad chips. The models have a security flaw in a standard component that comes on Broadcom chips called the Spectrum Analyzer, which is usually used to protect the modem from signal surges or disturbances coming from a faulty cable line. Whenever a connection issue is present, ISPs will use the Spectrum Analyzer for debugging and to ensure that you are receiving the connection quality that you pay for. Access is supposed to be limited to this component, but the Liarbird's researchers found that the Spectrum Analyzer does does not include protections against DNS rebinding attacks, they use default credentials, and they contain programming errors in the firmware. This can lead to a user being tricked into visiting a malicious website and an exploit being sent to the vulnerable component to execute commands from an attacker. Now, once they are hit, an attacker could enact a buffer overflow on the part to change the DNS server, they could start man in the middle attacks, they could hot swap the firmware or flash the firmware silently, disable ISP upgrades, change config files, change the MAC addresses, the serial number, or even exploit the modem altogether in a botnet, all of which are very, very serious problems. Now, the researchers dubbed this problem Cable Haunt, and they wrote a white paper discussing details of the attack and the vulnerability. They submitted the bug with CVE 2019-19494. It affects modems from vendors such as Aris, Compal, Netgear, Safemcom, Technicolor, and quite a few more. The researchers found that they were able to attack the modems in two different ways. So first off, they could compromise the component for local access by taking advantage of a flaw within the web socket used by the Spectrum Analyzer, which basically is just used to display data in the graphical front end within a browser. And then number two, they were also able to use a DNS rebind attack to gain remote access to the same part. DNS rebinding is used to manipulate the resolution of domain names, and as such, this attack could be used remotely. Now, with that said, though, the Spectrum Analyzer is only available within the internal network, so an attacker would need to use other attacks to gain access. Now, this means that it would probably need to be highly targeted in an attack. Now, at least 200 million modems are affected in Europe alone, several of which are already patching the flaw with updates. This number does not include modems used in other regions of the world, though, so the number could be multitudes higher. So check for upgrades. Lots has been happening on the SIM swapping front, so let's go ahead and get caught up. Now first, in the Princeton University academic study that was published on the 10th, five major US telcos were found to be vulnerable to SIM swapping attacks, in which an attacker can steal a mobile phone number by getting a wireless carrier to change the paired SIM to one that he or she is in possession of. Attackers can use SIM swapping to steal 2FA codes, texts, they can reset passwords for online sites, they can steal crypto wallets, and they could even steal identities. The academics used social engineering techniques to learn how customer support centers are set up with procedures for changing SIMs to determine how it happens and which carriers are vulnerable. Now, in total, they found AT&T, T-Mobile, TrackPhone, US Mobile, and Verizon Wireless were all susceptible to attacks due to faulty procedures for SIM changes. Now, in each of these cases, the researchers created 50 paid accounts so they would have 10 different SIMs pre paid for each carrier. They then made real calls to set up a realistic data history for each account, and eventually they would call to request a SIM swap. Now in each case, the researchers would give the customer service rep the wrong PIN and the wrong account owner details, but they would say that they had been a victim or of some kind of theft. Now to explain the incorrect information that they were giving to the customer service relationship manager, the researchers would say that they had been careless 
wireless when signing up, and they did not remember the information. Telcos would then need to authenticate the customer by asking about the last two calls made if the PIN and the account details were incorrect. An attacker would only need to trick a user into calling specific phone numbers so they could authenticate the carrier that they had actually used the phone number previously. Now, the researchers had notified carriers, but only T-Mobile had discontinued the call log authentication procedure. They then took the newly swapped SIMs with stolen phone numbers to 100 and 40 online sites to determine which ones only used SMS to authenticate an account and allow for access. From here, they created a website called issms2fasecure.com to share results, though the vulnerable sites are redacted. Now, though this technique was based on social engineering, another technique is using the remote desktop protocol, which is RDP for short, and social engineering to get telco employees to download RDP clients and allow the attacker into the internal network so they can do the SIM swap themselves. Now, due to the ongoing issues with SIM swapping, Oregon Senator Ron Wyden, alongside five other lawmakers, sent a letter to the FCC and Ajit Pai to demand an answer to why the FCC is doing absolutely nothing to help consumers protect their accounts. According to the letter, and I quote, consumers have no choice but to rely on phone companies to protect them against SIM swaps, and they need to be able to count on the FCC to hold mobile carriers accountable when they fail to secure their systems and thus harm consumers. The letter explains that some overseas carriers will only do a SIM swap after authentication via email, while some others send SIM swap data to financial institutions to make sure they are secure as well. The lawmakers requested an answer in one month on February 14th. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash threatwire. My hush puppy perk level patrons are awesome for sending in their fur baby photos. I love them so much. They keep me so happy, so keep them coming. And if you want to support Threatwire, but you don't want to be a Patreon supporter, I totally understand. I have opened up an online store of Threatwire swag so you can show off your support. Check out snubsy.com slash shop to get t-shirts, stickers, and even my own digital photography, all of which supports my shows. Thank you so much for your support. SHA-1, S-H-A-1, is a cryptographic hash function that was designed by the NSA, but since 2005, it has not been considered secure. Since 2010, many have upgraded to its replacements, like SHA-3. When 2017 rolled around, CWI Amsterdam and Google had performed collision attacks against SHA-1 again deeming it insecure. Now even while SHA-1 is old and easily broken, it is still in use today. It's the default hash function for PGP keys in GNUPG version 1.4, and Git still relies on SHA-1 to ensure data integrity. Now SHA-1 is still used on applications outside of the browser as well, but some security advocates are hoping that this newest research will actually change that. Now as of last Tuesday, SHA-1 was shown again to be insecure with a new attack. In this case, a collision attack can give an attacker more flexibility over the previous techniques, so they could create PGP keys to impersonate a target by producing the same hash for several inputs instead of just one. So that means that two different messages or files could be mapped to the same SHA-1 hash, even though they should have different values. Now the total technique costs $45,000 to implement, which is very minimal when compared to the previous SHA-1 attacks that cost more than $100,000. The researchers reported this to GNUPG, who now invalidate SHA-1 signatures created after January 2019, a CERT, who stated that they are planning to move away from SHA-1, and OpenSSL, who is considering disabling SHA-1 for security context. Now, the entire collision attack is not published since it has not been fixed, and it likely won't be, which is kind of unfortunate, so make sure you upgrade from SHA-1, because yes, it's broken, and it has been so for about a decade and a half. Now, before I leave, I would like to say 
Thank you so much to Hi Shannon, hello patron, Rabid Raccoon, Simon, Evan, Alex, and Dentios who joined the Patreon team this week. Y'all are awesome. Thank you so much for your support. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe down below. I'm Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet.